Mountain, to a mountain lion, and that of a true herbivore like a horse, you find we are far more like the herbivore than the carnivore. If you look at the mountain lion, you'll see that the jaw joint is an up and down vertical hinge. Uh, jaws of ca your house cat and mountain lions open up and down like a trap door. They cannot chew from side to side if they wanted to because their jaw joint won't permit it. Horses, uh, antelope on the other hand, have nice sliding jaw joints that permit them to chew in a rotary motion. And that works very nicely with their flat grinding molar teeth in the back of their lower jaw, which allows them to grind up grains and greens and grasses. That is exactly the same arrangement that you and I have. We have nice sliding jaw joints and flat grinding molar teeth. The back teeth of your house cat or a mountain lion are overlapping shearing fangs for tearing flesh. We really don't have carnivorous teeth. The stomach acid of a mountain lion is 20 times more concentrated than that of either a horse or a man because mountain lions are digesting flesh, which is protein that needs a lot of acid. These animals are digesting carbohydrates that require a lot less acid to digest. And finally, the mark of the intestine is a very key differentiating point. Whoever designed the mountain lion seemed to know again that when meat sits in the colon, it breaks down into carcinogens. And those cats do not want that meat sitting in the bowel for very long. And on, on a mountain lion, the intestine is 12 feet and out. It's time to move that stuff right out. The, that's a mark of a carnivore. The herbivores have the opposite situation. Horses and antelopes and gazelles are chewing up plant fiber all day. Their enzymes need a long time to break down all the plant fiber. So it's an herbivore's interest to have a great long intestine. And herbivores do, and so do we. If you were the size of a horse, your intestines would be one and a half times the length of a horse's intestine. We have great long and vigorous intestines, not very much acid in the stomach, flat grinding molar teeth, and sliding jaw joints. We are way more designed like an herbivore than a carnivore. Now, I'm not saying we are complete herbivores, and we do have the ability to digest small amounts of meat, I believe, as an emergency ration uh, to get us through times of, fa of famine. But if you eat a diet of all meat on your mountain lion, you'll die. If you eat a diet of all vegetable products, you'll thrive, and that's been shown throughout history. Now, when I make these comparisons, inevitably, somebody points to their canine teeth in their upper jaw, and they say, aha, what about these? Why were we given sharp teeth like this if we weren't supposed to be eating meat? To that, I can only reply that these canine teeth in our upper jaw work very well for biting into apples and bananas and potatoes, but they really aren't carnivorous teeth. If you want to see what a set of real carnivorous teeth look like, here they are. Now, if your teeth look like this, you can walk into McDonald's, order three Big Macs, say, don't bother to cook them, I'll take them just like they are. Uh, but seriously, if you look at the canine teeth on this big cat, uh, compared to the central incisors, you'll see the canines are much longer than the central incisors. If you look in the mirror at your own teeth, you'll find that your canines are shorter than your central incisors. They just don't work well for biting through flesh. And if you think they do, run this little thought experiment. Imagine running out to the nearest cow you see, jump on its back, open your mouth, and take a big bite out of its backside. Now what are you gonna find? You're gonna find that your mouth is very small, and that your teeth are very short, and that you can't bite through that animal's hide, let alone its muscle, and you're going to get bounced off of that cow and walk away very hungry. So the effects of an animal-based diet on the human digestive system and the human body have just been disastrous. It has led to an epidemic of clogged arteries, of obesity, of cancer of the colon and the, pros pro the breast and the prostate gland, drains calcium out of our bone and gives us high blood pressure, and fats on the body soak up insulin, and insulin is what you need to burn up your blood sugar. And people who are obese frequently uh, have adult onset diabetes and they can't handle their blood sugar. As people get leaner, their fat stores go down, it frees up their insulin, and many patients in my practice have had their diabetes go away because they get nice and lean and they've got plenty of insulin that works. And this has been my experience in my medical practice. When I saw Mr. Phillips and all that fat in his blood, and I decided to change my diet, wonderful things happen. I learned how to make a couple of good breakfasts and lunches and dinners. And I took a walk every day, and something remarkable happened in my body. First of all, I'm very, most clearly a 20-pound spare tire of fat around my waist, which I couldn't shake, even though I was running five miles a day. That spare tire in six weeks just melted right away, and I started waking up in a nice, lean, light body, and it felt great. My cholesterol level dropped down from 220 down to 140. My blood pressure, which had been 150 over 90, dropped down to 110, 70, and it felt wonderful waking up in a nice, lean, light body every day. Well, with that, I knew that there was not only a change in my life, but there was a change in my medical career happening because there I was learning to be an anesthesiologist. And I was literally spending my day putting people to sleep. 
And I felt that if I wanted to be a good physician and keep people out of hospitals, it was time to help them wake up. So I had six months left in my residency, but I went to the head of anesthesia and said, sir, as much as I enjoy anesthesia, I'm going back to general practice. And I did. And I moved down to Florida and I opened up a little clinic. But this time I was smart. In the clinic, I put in a little kitchen because you just can't tell what people not to eat. You got to say, here's what you eat. And I had a vegetarian chef come in and we showed people twice a week how to, how to cook grains and make salad dressings. And we showed them breakfasts and lunches and dinners. And those people who could eat in that delicious style, and it's delicious, uh, and take a walk every day, noticed the same wonderful changes I did. I'd have them come in the office and step on the scale and get their blood pressure checked. And as the weeks went by, this marvelous downward progression of numbers started showing up on their chart. Their weight would go down by about two pounds a week if they were overweight. If they had high blood pressure, the blood pressure would come right on down. If they had high cholesterol, the cholesterol level would come right on down. If they were diabetic, their blood sugars would come right on down to normal. And very happily for me, the dosage of powerful medications I had these people on for their high blood pressure and their diabetes, I could lower them right on down and, in fact, many times get them off those medications completely including those for high blood pressure and diabetes, those pills that people are told they must take for the rest of their life. It's not that hard to get someone off high blood pressure pills. Just get all that fat and sodium, which is found in the meats and the dairy products, out of their diet, and most people's high blood pressure comes down to normal. But the best part is they'd be walking out of the office and they say, you know, doctor, it's nice, my blood pressure's down, it's nice, my cholesterol. You know the best part? I haven't felt this good in years. I feel light and clean. I got energy. I sleep better. My breath is cleaner. I feel good. And that just warmed this old doctor's heart no end. Uh, medical school never really prepared me for people getting healthy. And uh, yet, uh, there they were, getting healthier right in front of my eyes. It, uh, it was really exciting to see. Now, the problems that I mentioned with meat, too much fat, too much protein, and no fiber, are common to all meats, whether it be red meat or poultry or fish. Have no illusions. Animal muscle is animal muscle, and they all have too much fat, too much protein, and no fiber. But nowadays, uh, animals are not raised in Old McDonald's barnyard out in the sunshine, so there's a whole new set of problems because the animals are raised on factory farms in conditions of tremendous overcrowding. These animals are fed grains that are sprayed with herbicides and pesticides. These are fat-soluble substances. They concentrate in the flesh and the eggs and the milk of the animals. And the largest amount of pesticides and hydrocarbons coming into your diet are not those sprayed on fruits and vegetables. They come in the meats and the dairy products. And if you want to decrease the amount of pesticides you eat, consider cutting down the amount of animal products you eat. The animals in factory farm systems are fed tremendous amounts of antibiotics. When you feed antibiotics to animals, they grow bigger and they are less prone to infection. And half the antibiotics made in the United States, 30 million pounds of them a year, are fed to animals in their feed. Well, what happens when you feed a potent animal, uh, when you feed an animal a potent antibiotic like lincomycin, tetracycline, sulfonamides, ampicillin? What happens? Well, what you do is you kill off the antibiotic, uh, you kill off the bacteria in that animal's intestines that are susceptible to the antibiotic. What do you leave behind? The roughest, toughest antibiotic resistant bacteria going. And they have names like Salmonella, Shigella, Clostridia. You eat an underdone piece of chicken or burger with Salmonella bacteria on it, you're going to be very sorry. It rips up the lining of your intestine, gives you a bloody diarrhea. If you're an adult, it'll put you in the hospital with an intravenous going. And if you're a child, it'll dehydrate you and kill you. Yeah, on this continent, over four million people every year get sick with salmonella food poisoning, largely from eating poultry and meat. The chicken carcasses are brought into the kitchen and slopped around all over the cutting board, and it contaminates the utensils in the kitchen. And, um, and uh, it's becoming a, a worrisome problem of major, major proportions. Antibiotics can lead to tainted meat. You bet they can, and more and more people are getting concerned about it. You don't have to give antibiotics to broccoli. Uh, you're going to see more and more headlines like this. Here's hundreds of people sick in Illinois from salmonella poisoning in milk. Uh, here are underdone burgers causing salmonella food poisoning. Here's a dreadful one. 400,000 hens and a million eggs poisoned with polychlorinated biphenyls. This is an industrial chemical in uh, electrical transformers that, uh, when it's discarded from industry, winds up excuse me, winds up in uh, the rivers and into the oceans and into the fish and accumulates in the fish flesh. Do you know that half the Canadian fish flesh is not eaten by people? Um, it's ground up and either made into fertilizer or added to animal feed. And here uh, was a tremendous amount of PCB.